Dear colleagues, we are continuing with our session and we have a fascinating session to look forward to. Um, but first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, Professor Herzak, who, without, uh, without talking to me, uh, put me to head this session. And I have no idea where, where, where he got the intuition. The thing is that in recent years I've had a massive interest in Spain. And it's, it's just it's this very fascinating, it all came together very interestingly. We'll, and we'll be having very interesting discussions with the Spanish experience. Um, just the arrival, to, 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 one time when I arrived to, to Spain, I decided to finally go to the Valley of the Memory. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a, 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 I, I don't know about other countries, but very often it's referred in Ukraine. The Spanish uh, experience of uh, reconciliation has become paradigmatic for some uh, scholars. And so I was very interested in this material uh, implementation of this process of reconciliation. Um, of course, several things uh, made me very hesitant from the beginning because this process of reconciliation and constructing this huge basilica in the valley of the memory and this huge cross that you can see from the space, it, started, it was started by Franco. And, um, you know, it's, it made sense to go there for me to understand a few things. This is a grandiose structure which includes uh, uh, the grave of Franco. Step stoop. He's buried there in that basilica, in that church, uh, by this, by the altar. Uh, the victims of the civil war uh, are are to the left and to the right. So the republicans and the Fran Francoists, they're kind of separated that way. And in front of the basilica, we see a massive, uh, massive, massive uh, square. Uh, the point of which I couldn't understand at first, but eventually it was explained to me that up to a certain year the Francoists got together there, there's a fantastic panorama there, um, mountains and forests and such, and this was the place, uh, they didn't do anything particularly uh, pronounced, but it was some kind of demonstration, and this memorial of reconciliation performed also another function, um, you understand, it's uh, not entirely um, uncontroversial. So our session today is, uh, uh, my expectations are very high, and I'm sure that you too will be happy. Uh, we'll be talking about, uh, about the Spain uh, of Franco, uh, of Francoist Spain, of how this reconciliation took place. We'll be discussing the uh, the post frank post frank francoist uh, reconciliation process and today we'll have a presentation about spain and about ukraine uh, about spain and what we should and shouldn't do in ukraine now i would like to present uh, the participants of the sessions today's speakers each of them will be speaking in each of them will have 20 minutes for, for every minute that they go over time, I'll be charging them uh, material penalties. So I hope to uh, become very rich. Uh, but speaking today are, first of all, Julian Casanova, uh, uh, who is professor of modern history at the University in Saragossa. Uh, he is uh, the author of many publications, um, uh, and additionally, he works at the European University in Budapest, CEU, Central European University in Budapest. Uh, the se our second speaker is, uh, I will try to uh, pronounce, get his name right, Jose Nunez Seixas. Good, I got it. And um, I should say that Professor Casanova was born in 1956 and Professor Seixas uh, was born in 1966. He um, was born in Galicia. He um, studied uh, history at uh, Santiago de Compostela, as well as uh, at Dijon University in France. He has numerous publications to his name in 20th century history. He has um, looked into the phenomenon of nationalism and many other, many other interesting and fundamental works. 
And finally, our third speaker of the of the of this uh, session is Professor Tomasz Andrzejczyk, uh, working at the um, Institute for uh, Political Studies at the Polish Academy of Sciences, and is also an author of uh, fascinating works. Uh, particularly, he has written works, special works on Ukraine, and on the development of the historical uh, scholarship and historiography, intellectual history of Ukraine. And today he will be speaking about uh, the, the very interesting topic. He will be comparing Spain, Spanish experience and uh, Ukrainian experience. I therefore give the floor to our first speaker of this session, uh, Julian Casanova. <coughs> Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, first of all, I must thank the organizers for having me here today um, in Albiv and for giving me the opportunity to share uh, research and arguments with so distinguished uh, colleagues and to share also this uh, comparative perspective I think that uh, comparative analysis is key for not only for understanding history and confronting history, but also for avoiding the uses, political and abuse, use and abuse, political use of history. And also I think it's a big difference between history, politics and journalism in a comparative analysis, the similarities and differences between different cases uh, help to avoid, uh, to confuse journalism, history, and politics. Well, the, the title of my talk could be History and Memory of Traumatic Past, a Political and Cultural Battleground. And as the title of my talk uh, may suggest, Traumatic past, wars and dictatorships uh, often cause conflicts between different memories, both of individual and groups, and between different ways of looking at history. Although Spaniards commonly believe that not agreeing over the past and having conflicting memories of it is a peculiarity of our, our own country and culture, we would be the champions of civil wars. In reality, similar fractures have occurred and still happen in all countries which have suffered criminal political regimes, such as, among others, Nazi Germany, Stalinist Russia, the military dictatorships of Chile and Argentina, or Franco's Spain. In such cases, as stated in regard of Nazism by German historian Ernest Nolte, the past refuses to be forgotten, and both history and memory, far from being neutral ground, become a political and a cultural battleground. This is the present situation in Spain, 80 years after the start of the Civil War and 40 years since the death of Franco. The Spanish Civil War for Spaniards has got down in history and in memory for the way it dehumanized its adversaries and for the horrific violence that it generated. Lawless, arbitrary shootings and massacres eliminated enemies, real or presumed, on both sides. But if you pay attention to the international, international impact of the Spanish Civil War, uh, the Spanish Civil War is so relevant, it was so relevant, because there were various conflicts involved in the Spanish Civil War. It was a war between classes, between different conceptions of the social order, between Catholicism 
and anti-clericalism, over the idea of nation and over the ideas and creeds that dominated the international scene uh, at the time. The Civil War crystallized worldwide battles between landowners and workers, between church and state, and between obscurantism and modernization, which were also being fought out elsewhere between communism and fascism, while the debilitated, the debilitated democracies looked on. The Spanish Civil War was followed by a long and civil peace. So the official end of the war on the 1st of April 1939 did not put a stop to violence. Thus began a new period of mass execution, prison, and torture for thousands of men and women. Death was unleashed with total impunity in the post-war. At least 50,000 people were executed in the decade following, following the end of the war, without counting the thousands of deaths caused by hunger and disease in various prisons. Franco's dictatorship was, in short, a regime of terror that, like all modern terror systems, rested not only on state power, but also on the support of some sectors of society who helped the state to violate systematically the human rights of the other sectors of the Spanish population. After the war, during Franco's uncivil peace, the victors settled accounts with the defeated, reminding them for decades who were the patriots and who were the traitors. Streets, public squares, schools, and hospitals in hundreds of towns and cities bore thereafter, in many cases to this day, the names of military insurgents, high-ranking fascist leaders, and pro insurgent Catholic politicians. The final consecration of the memory of the victors of the Civil War came, however, with the construction of the Valle de los Caídos, Valley of the Fallen. It was inaugurated on the 1st of April, 1959, after nearly 20 years of construction, during which time thousands of captive breads labored there as political prisoners. This was a site intended to portray the grandeur of Franco's cause, an eternal tribute to the sacrifice of the, and I quote, the heroes and martyrs of the crusade. The other dead, the many thousands of compatriots categorized as red traitors who had been extrajudicially killed during the war and its aftermath did not officially exist either because their deaths had never been registered or else because the cause of death had been falsified. The bodies of this other death were abandoned in fields, under cemetery walls, and in mass graves. So their families, their children and grandchildren are still looking for them today, aided now for various associations and forums for what is termed the recovery of historical memory. So, there is no doubt about the definition and existence of these political crimes. The democratic transition of the later 1970s and early 1980s, however, forgave them, amnestying the perpetrators of Franco's state violence, police and army personnel above all, enclosed the subject without any public discussion. But in recent years, there has developed in Spain a bitter debate 
about historical memories and over compensation for victims of the dictatorships. Four decades after the death of Franco, there are also calls for retributive justice, punitive justice against those still living who were responsible for these crimes, a process open in Argentina, and I know that there is a new process is going to be open in Mexico at the end of this month. Cruelty, intolerance, and violence were distinguishing features of the 20th century and had a decisive impact on Spain and during the dictatorship. Franco, who ran a dictatorship in Spain for almost 40 years, died a natural death in November 1975, and after his death, there was no talk of setting up truth commissions to investigate the thousands of murders and human rights breaches committed during the dictatorship, nor were the alleged murderers or perpetrators of these violence acts brought to trial. However, for instance, on the contrary, in the countries of the southern corn, for example, particularly in Chile, in Argentina, truth commissions and reports on human rights breaches laid the foundation for the reconstruction of democracy and collective memory. Some people think that this lack of the official truth in Spain marks the difference between Spanish democracy and the democracies that follow the military dictatorships in the countries of the Southern Corn. But it is not as simple as that. I don't share this point of view. In Spain, during the first two decades of the transition to democracy, I'm going to focus in the two first decades, and Professor Nunez says us in the last years, during the first two decades of the transition to democracy, revealing this brutal history was almost exclusively the work of a diverse group of historians who, on the basis of new sources, discussed ways of interpreting the past and began to compare it with what had happened in other societies. These studies were disseminated within academic circles, and they changed knowledge about this long period of contemporary Spanish history. However, the arguments and conclusions failed to reach a wider public and were of scant interest to the media. The society that emerged from Francoism and grew in the first two decades of democracy displayed marked signs of indifference towards the cause of the victims of the Civil War and the dictatorship. With the Amnesty Act of 15 of October 1977, the state ruled out any future legal inquiries into, and I quote, crimes committed by public servants violating human rights. The traumatic memory of the war was interpreted as a kind of collective madness with abominable crimes in both camps. This is also the argument used by the political right today when you are talking about history. No? They always refer to this collective eh, responsibility in both camps, eh, forgetting or avoiding the analysis of the dictatorship of long dictatorship of 40 years. For various reasons, the battle to uncover the hidden past to learn the truth and demand justice were never distinguishing features of the transition to democracy in Spain. Despite the efforts of historians to analyze those events and pass their findings on to future generations. Spain was full of lieux de mémoire, 
for the victors of the Civil War, with the valley of the fallen holding price of place, however, the other dead, the tens of thousands of Republicans murdered during the war and post-war period simply didn't exist. During the first two decades of transition and democracy, no government or Democratic Party showed any interest in encouraging debate over redressing this injustice. Nor, were, or nor was there any strong social pressure to reverse this official disregard for the crimes of the Francoist dictatorship. This began to change gradually during the second half of the 90s, when previously unknown facts and figures regarding the victims of the civil war and dictatorship uh, came to light. This coincided with the growing importance that international opinion was given to debates on human rights and the need for remembrance of wars and dictatorships following the end of the Cold War and the disappearance of the communist regimes of Eastern Europe. Thus emerged what I call a new social construction of memory. A section of society began to mobilize. Associations for the recovery of historical memory were set up. Mass graves were exhumed in the search for the dead who were never registered. And the descendants of those killed by the Francoists, more often their grandchildren than their children, began to ask what had happened, why this story of death and humiliation had been covered up, and who the executioners had been. In recent years, then, a very clear tension has arisen between, on the one hand, the work of historians conducting empirical investigation, and, on the other, the recollections and memories of the protagonists or of their descendants. What the public in Spain today knows of the war or about Franco's dictatorships is increasingly conditioned by what is transmitted about them in the pages of the press or on the radio or television programs. Information and opinion blur the boundaries between historians who follow a recognized professional methodology and the history buffs and enthusiasts. As a result of this dominance of memory and opinion, interest in more methodological and theoretical reflection has decreased, while we have seen a flood of mostly a critical and informed subjectivity when it comes to writing of historical topics. Besides, the research of outrages committed by the military rebels and by the dictatorship also brought about a reaction from well-known journalists, right-wing propagandists, and amateur historians, a kind of neo-Francoist revisionist historiography who resurrected the same old arguments of Francoist manipulation. So the history of the Spanish Civil War and the dictatorship, in short, is no longer the exclusive preserve of historians. And there are now many people who wish to address the past in political terms, and in the case of the descendants of the victims, in ethical terms. But this is a uh, Professor Nunez says a topic in the second part. Only I, I would like to, to stress or to anticipate the obstacles eh, which uh, we met eh, when we started to uh, 
not only to teach or to research about history, but to distribute books and learnings about this history. To conclude, and so uh, I'm not going to pay you anything, okay? To conclude, I would like to make a final remark on history and memory. To combat the silence and indifference towards that organized terror, whose outcome in all cases was a strong dose of brutality and the breaking up of the state, the only remedy is public memory policies based on archives, museums, and education. Usually the political discussion about this forget or forgets the museums, the archives, and education. And without archives, there is no history. And there is no history transmitted to the future generations. Democratic states need to compile and preserve documents and testimonies from their periods of dictatorships. Furthermore, it all needs to be disseminated and made available to researchers and relevant institutions. We sometimes meet, eh, meet this, eh, let's say, impossibility to go to the archives because they are closed yet. No? This recent history also needs to be taught and values of tolerance and freedom transmitted to the young. I think this is one of the best eh, aims of our professionals as well. And so in my opinion, it is not enough just to set up course to judge history, but also to try to understand and explain what happened. As Father Luis Pérez de Aguirre wrote, in his Memoria de los Detenidos Desaparecidos en Uruguay, Memoir of the Missing Arrested in Uruguay, the past, and I quote, is remembered and judged not just to punish or condemn, but also to learn from. And I subscribe this. In the last years, a new social dimension of the politics of memory and retribution has appeared in Spain as well as a wide reaction of the heirs of the victims and perpetrators. The inauguration of memorials dealing with this era, the opening of mass graves, and the success of books, documentaries, and films on this violent past have also given an insight to the scope of this social dimension. And let me finish with some relevant questions I think historians and social scientists are asking in Spain, in Latin America, and in many places. Is it appropriate to punish those who committed injustices in the past? How does the desire for punishment and vengeance affect the stability of now democratic societies? Is it possible years later, in Spain 40 years later, to embark on punitive justice, punishment for the perpetrators, and corrective justice, compensation for the victims, without reopening the wounds that reconciliation and pardon could supposedly heal? Well, I do not think it's a good idea to ask for punitive justice now, 40 years after the death of Franco. But controversy apart, we as historians need to follow the path cleared in the last three decades with serious, well-written, and well-distributed studies and to fight for these views to be heard in. That is our best contribution to this social dimension of the memory and of the past. The rest is history, and historians are researching about history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Casanova. And now uh, our next speaker.
uh, we have so-called part two of our uh, Spanish history story. <laughs> Professor uh, Jose Seixas. <laughs> Okay, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference, particularly Yaroslav and Martin, for giving me the opportunity to come back to Eastern Galicia. And for me, this is a very special opportunity because it's my first time in this Galicia. I am from the other Galicia, from the Iberian Galicia. So, in a sense, I feel at home. Uh, <laughs> secondly, although your accent is a little bit different, but I mean, uh, Secondly, I uh, have to say that, as it always happens, I think Professor Casanova has uh, said almost everything, so I'm afraid that my paper is going to partly overlap with his talk. Nevertheless, I will try to do my best to say something different as well. Uh, well, as Professor Casanova has expressed and has already explained, the overall picture of the Spanish transition to democracy until the beginning of the 21st century was most regarded as a success story. I mean, the idea that Spaniards had been able to overcome the shadows of the past 150 years of continuous civil wars, and uh, they had been able to come to terms, to come to an agreement, and uh, to overcome dictatorship and to enter a more or less modern democracy was seen by almost everybody, by political scientists, and by European and world public opinion, as a kind of lesson, because it was not expected. I mean, 74, 75, many journalists and observers still believed that Spain could be a risk, could follow perhaps the Portuguese path, the Portuguese revolutionary path, and given the antecedents of Spanish history, this would end in a disaster and a new uh, in, a, in, a, in a new war. Nevertheless, it was not the case. The price for this was, according to uh, political scientist Paloma Aguilar, the forgetting the civil war, the price for this was oblivion, the absence of any politics of memory, the absence of any critical view of the past, particularly of the recent past. And this was maintained, it was held by the main actors which made transition to democracy possible, which were uh, mostly political elites, politica, political and cultural elites, and was continued by the socialist, the Social Democratic Party, the Socialist Party, as it came in to office, into office between 82 and 96. Uh, there was, for instance, almost no official commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the, Spanish, the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War in 1986. Uh, official declaration, the official statement by the Socialist Party was a civil war doesn't uh, deserve to be remembered. It must be forgotten and our task now is to become Europeans and to look towards the future. Nevertheless, the picture began to change in the mid 90s and particularly at the beginning of the 21st century. And this has to do with several factors. I mean, increasing sectors of Spanish public opinion became engaged with a more critical view of the past, particularly of the recent dictatorial past, as well as of the Spanish, of the legacy of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, this had to do with, first, with uh, party politics as well, uh, 19, 1993, the Catalan branch of the Spanish Socialist Party used for the first time the remembrance, the ghost of the Civil War as a warning to the voters, I mean, just to avoid the conservatives come back to power. Uh, 96, it, it was repeated, but these were, these were isolated events. Actually, uh, the first impulse came not from political parties, came not from political elites, came not from opinion makers, came from some actors of civil society. There was a kind of generation factor. It is known, remember Halbachs and other authors, that the grandchildren tend to remember what the children, what the sons want to forget. 
So uh, there was a new generation who came to its coming of age and who felt not obliged, felt not committed to the agreement of the transition. In their view, the dark sides of the Spanish past has to be highlighted and they wanted to remember what their parents had forgotten. Uh, this is quite a well-known phenomenon. As I said in the Spanish case, its main agents were neither professional historians nor political actors, but rather some associations rooted in civil society, which started exhuming the corpses of dozens of victims, of hundreds of victims of Franco's repression who had been buried in anonymous graves since 1936 and who had been never identified. The first exhumations were conducted by the descendants of the dead, such as the journalist Emilio Silva, and attracted international media attention since 2000, as they denounced the Spanish state before the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations. They founded a dense network of associations, known as Associations for the Recovery of Historical Memory, which spread over all over Spain and recruited volunteers for exhuming the corpses. Although they were pressed by some political parties, particularly by the Communist Party, to give a more political and engaged dimension to their activity, the association's founder, Emilio Silva, replied that they did not represent a political project for families, but a feminist project for politicians. This had a double dimension. dimension. First, Spanish society and public opinion was forced to confront itself with a consequence of the civil war that had been largely ignored in public discussions. The existence of hundreds of common graves or mass graves, although we shouldn't think in Eastern European terms, we're not thinking about, I mean, Spanish common mass graves are not, have not the dimension of Pabillar or Catin. Obviously, they are much more reduced, but they are quite a lot. This is the official map of the Spanish Minister of Justice. And you see that now you see Andalusia and then uh, the, the island of Palma de Mallorca, of Mallorca. This reminded as well a very familiar phenomenon for the Spanish public opinion. It's published public opinion in the 1990s at the beginning of the 21st century, did not think of its common graves or these mass graves in Eastern European terms. They were not thinking about Babi Yar. They were thinking about the missing of the military dictatorships in South America. Second, it became evident that the legacy of the civil war, as it had been usually sustained by representatives of the right, had not yet been surpassed after 60 years. In fact, several opinion surveys displayed that the percentage of Spaniards who had not forgotten the Civil War rose from 40% in 95 to 51% in 2000. And by 2005, almost two thirds of Spaniards hold the view that the task of the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory was positive. The revival of memory was also a part of a, of a transnational phenomenon, which was marked by the reception in Spain of Southern American debates on the memory of the victims of the military dictatorships of the 1970s, which acquired a new push, a new impulse, thanks to the arrest of General Augusto Pinochet during his visit to London in October 98. Figures such as the judge Baltasar Garzón who led the judicial procedure against Pinochet became transnational icons of the human rights movements all over the world, and also attempted to put on trial the surviving perpetrators, at least from a symbolic point of view, of Franco's repression. The ultimate reaction of the Spanish judicial system towards these attempts was to disable Batasar Garzón, as it is known. Political scientists came to an astonishing conclusion. Latin American post-dictatorial societies have been much more successful 
uh, despite all the inconvenience, the existence of uh, laws of, uh, of uh, final point, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, has been much more successful in achieving some transitional justice, which was, as Professor Casanova has explained, completely absent in the Spanish transition. As I said, the protagonists of this revival came mostly from below, from civil society. They grouped themselves in, associa in associations and were financed at the beginning by the donations of its members. Their activity also attracted the attention of left-wing political parties, particularly of the Socialist Party, which took up a part of the agenda of the association of the memory movement since 2003 and promised the enactment of a law on historical memory if in case it came to power at the general election of 2004. Alongside the exhumation of the remnants of the victims of the Franco's repression, the memory movement denounced the persistence of Francoist sites of memory, particularly of public sculptures devoted to General Franco in towns such as Ferrol, Santander, or Guadalajara, which have been removed in the last years, over the last years, but which had been the object of some imaginative protests. For instance, Franco's oh, sculpture in Ferrol his birthplace was painting rose. <coughs> I know similar actions have been undertaken in Eastern Europe as well. The first period of the socialist government, presided by Rodriguez Zapatero between 2004 2008, saw a multiplication and diversification of public and private initiatives towards the recovery of historical memory. The year 2006 was, was officially declared the year of historical memory. As the first Zapatero government did not enjoy absolute majority in the parliament, it was forced by all the forces of the left, which gave its support to implement the electoral promise of passing a law on historical memory, which was finally passed by the Spanish parliament at the end of 2007, with opposition, of course, of the Conservative Party, uh, Popular Party. The text of the law was far more moderate than expected by the memory movement, which has criticized it. Among other aspects, because the law did not contemplate the creation of a truth commission, similar to those of Argentina or South Africa, other deficits were the lack of annulment of the verdicts by all Francoist courts and military trials, the lack of economic reparation to the victims, etc. The law also granted recognition to the victims of red terror, of Republican terror during the Spanish Civil War, which had not been repaired by the Franco regime. Granted financial support to the activities of the memory associations regarding exhumations of un unidentified victims and decreed the steady replacement or removal of Franco's street names, symbols, monuments, and sites of memory, including the renaming of street names and squares, which was left in the hands of municipalities. And the body of the fallen should be the object of a special treatment and be transformed into a center for the study of historical memory. An advisory commission was designed to decide on this. However, the subsequent conservative government, government presided by Mariano Rajoy since 2011, has simply put the implementation of this law on ice, has frozen the implementation of this law, and has steadily reduced the financing of exhumations with the argument, the excuse, the lack of money, lack of financial resources, and the necessity to meet the requirements by the European Union. So at the end, responsibility is, I mean, uh, at the end, Mrs. Merkel is made responsible for that. Parallel to this, and also linked to the new look at the past, the memory movement also began to express increasing criticism towards the process of democratic transition of the second half of the 1970s. 
and particularly condemn the purportedly excessive concessions made by the democratic opposition in terms of memory and reconciliation, in terms of politics of memory. This also meant questioning the positive interpretation of the process of transition as a peaceful path towards a fully satisfactory Western European style democracy. On the contrary, memory activists voiced that time had come for the 1978 agreement to enter retirement. And a new pact should be done. The absence of any form of transitional justice, of politics of memory towards the dictatorial past and the oblivion of the civil war were regarded at, as the top of the iceberg or as symbols for the continuity of several democratic deficits inherited from Francoism. There had not been a pact of silence, but there had not been an elite agreement, simply post-Francoist elites, but particularly military, this was the new interpretation, had imposed oblivion on the support of the democratic opposition. What kind of deficits are purportedly related to the lack of politics of memory according to large sectors of Spanish public opinion? The persistence of the monarchy, which must not be forgotten, was actually restored by Franco himself. The continuity of important parts of the Francoist state apparatus, particularly in areas such as police, army, and the judicial system, the limitations of the Spanish welfare state due to the important parcels of power retained by post-Francoist social and economic elites, the deficiencies of the functioning of democratic institutions, and the lack of satisfactory recognition of the multinational character of the Spanish polity. As a consequence, there was an intricate connection between the absence and or the limitations of post-Francoist politics of memory on the one hand and the persistence deficits of the functioning of Spanish democracy in the present on the other hand. This was the main argument. As an opposite reaction, the post-Francoist discourse on the Spanish Civil War and Francoism is far from having disappeared, has limited itself to repeat the same arguments put forward by Franco's historiography in the 1930s, 1940s, has received some new impulses coming from new media groups, and particularly has refashioned its products, but the arguments continue to be the same. Quite interestingly, the arguments have also been reinforced through a selective appropriation of Eastern European debates on post-dictatorial memory. For instance, the parallelism between the oh, the parallelism between the massacre of 2,000 right-wing civilians in Madrid, uh, in the outskirts of Madrid, in Paraguayos, the Jarama. You may see this cross when you land at the airport of Madrid, Barajas. And Catin, for instance, a right-wing journalist who is very known in Spain, Cesar Vidal, has published this book uh, Paracuellos Catin as a parallelism. Uh, it's not the only example, but the important thing is that this is a debate which has very little impact on present day professional academic discussions. Uh, there is no Spanish historical stride, there is no real Ernst Nolte in the Spanish Academy. The Spanish Nolte is the North American. Uh, Hispanist Stanley Payne, who is now in his late 80s or perhaps his early 90s. Uh, anyway, a matter of discussion is, I will refer to this afterwards, uh, whether a kind of soft of low intensity revisionism is now emerging, which is mostly, which is mostly held by some uh, very conservative circles and, some, and Catholic universities. And, uh, the new discussion of the Civil War and the nature of Francoism was also reenacted among Spanish historians. Certainly, both periods had never vanished from their thematic concerns of Spanish historiography, but now there is a generation clash. I mean, 
Professor Casanova has referred to this as well. The memory movement has to do with generation change. Uh, the new discussions taking place in Spanish historiography, which adopt a much more critical stance towards the transition period, also are also related to a generation change. Younger historians tend to be much more critical. Certainly, not all debates display a similar level of theoretical coherence. As Paris-based uh, historian Mercedes Justa has written, everybody, everybody set out to talk about memory without previously having a precise concept of what memory is. And the theoretical devices used by, used by many historians, professional and non-professional, have been rather weak. And the proof of this is that no original contribution in the realm of the concept of memory and historical memory has been made from Spanish historiography. We simply, or has Spanish historians had simply tended to adopt the concepts of models crafted by other historians, or by other historiographies. Uh, three examples very briefly mentioned. First, the discussion about, it is a, a about the use of the convenience of the use of the term genocide to refer to Franco's repression. The second one uh, regard concerns the definition of the Franco regime, whether the Franco regime was a fascist regime or not, whether it was a Catholic fascism or not, whether it was a fascisticide Catholic authoritarian dictatorship or not. Uh, obviously, for many non-professional historians and for the opinion makers in Spain today, the question is uh, fascist means, or that to define something as fascist, to define the Franco's regime as fascist from the beginning to the through the 1970s, means to ascribe Franco is a definitely negative character while the, let's say, theoretical, the purely theoretical discussion about what fascism is, is left aside. And a third example would be the role and the meaning ascribed to political violence in the left. And basic discussion here is, should we continue to talk about good guys and bad guys? The good guys were all Republicans bad guys or Franquists, well, perhaps it's clear who is the bad guy, but it's not that clear whether all good guys were good guys, particularly whether anarchists and uh, communists, etc., were also defending the republic or were defending something else, which I think this is very relevant when talking about it in Eastern Europe. We should not forget that among the defenders of the republic, the theoretically defenders of the republic, there were people like Enver Hoxha, uh, people like Erich Milke, people like Erno Guerrero and others who were members of the National Brigades and who had a later career which was not particularly identified with democracy. So we should take up this discussion in a, but not in a passionate way. Uh, well, uh, to conclude, what happens today? Well, actually, the problem of the or there are many problems in uh, the definition of public debates regarding the policies of the recent past in Spain, but there is not any, there is uh, not a shared culture of remembrance, which is even shared by those parties and those political sectors which are identified with the continuity of the 1978 constitution. We should refer to a landscape, to a panorama of fragmented memories where almost every political family, every politi each political culture, even different territories, keep loyal to their own partisan political cultures. And this implies that the right is not, and particularly the democratic right and the present-day conservatives are not eager to condemn Franco's regime. They are not eager to remove street, name, street names referred or related to 
the, the Civil War and the Francoist regime, they are not eager to revise their view of history. To give you an example, this plaque on the, this was, this plaque remembering the fallen soldiers of the Legion Condor was removed in 2002 from the Spanish, from the cemetery of La Almudena in Madrid. It was removed due to the insistence of the German embassy. The Madrid conservative municipality was reluctant to remove it. But they simply, the German ambassador had to call in person the Madrid mayor and say, well, I am German, I want this plaque to be removed. <laughs> I think this is a good example of this. Uh, on the other hand, the new left, the Podemos weekend movement, still keeps very attached to this critical view of the transition. The idea is we must make another transition, although he has nuanced his position of his critical view along the last days. Uh, nevertheless, new, the new left measures are now applying and implementing the law of historical memory in all, the muni in all municipalities they are now ruling. Uh, they still oppose the success, the view of, of the interpretation of the, st the transition to democracy as a success story. And certainly uh, the conclusion could be at least regarded from a comparative angle that the Spanish case is perhaps not an example to be followed, but there are not examples to be followed. I mean, each country follows its own dynamics and has to meet its own requirements. Our societies have the right to remember, all, but also many societies, all, all societies, have the right to selectively forget if there is a broad social consensus on this. Uh, the adoption by the state of a critical view of the dictatorial past, we must remember, only succeeded in other European countries, such as Italy or Germany, 30, 40 years after the end of the dictatorship and the occupation. Uh, the Spanish process is perhaps a belated case, but it's not an absolute exception. It's one more experience to compare with and to learn from. The discussion has also some more implications. The Spanish discussion has also some collateral implications. First, Spanish professional historians do not still know, I don't know whether Professor Casanova agrees on that, do not still know what their place in this public discussion is. Second, perhaps as a consequence of this, they are tolerating the coexistence of parallel of opposing discourses about the recent past, that of opinion makers and that of professional historiography. But what's the role of academic historians? Do we have to remain close in our nice departments and simply to produce knowledge which has no social impact? Or do we have to intervene more actively in public discussions? The problem is that I mean, at least compared to the German public sphere, uh, audibility of Spanish historians is much more reduced, it's much lesser. Third, uh, obviously, are civil wars comparable to other experiences, such as foreign occupation, or, or not to speak, not to talk about the Holocaust, particularly because in civil wars, the label good guys and bad guys is not always that easy to ascribe. I mean, as I said in the Spanish case, we know who were the bad guys, but it's quite difficult to identify with the good guys as well. And as far as we are as apart, as, as, or as far as we don't understand the complexity of this intricate uh, relationship, we, would, we will not move forward. This is my pessimistic conclusion. Thank you very much.
thank you for this uh, interesting presentation. And now we've seen with you the, 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 the real picture with the politics of memory in Spain. It's fascinating stuff. And I've had this thought that since we and Alexander Lysenko are editors of, uh, of the Ukrainian historical journal, we would like it would be very interesting for professional historians to print these materials, to publish these materials. This is really fascinating stuff um, to hear these things from the Spaniards. And uh, now, the most interesting thing, what do we do with Ukraine? Now, uh, Professor Tomasz Trejek will tell us all about that, um, about what we're supposed to do and how we use or fail to use the experience of Spain. Dear participants, uh, uh, first what I should say is that I am not a Spaniard. Arf unfortunately, I am not a Spaniard. I am a Pole. I am a Pole, yes, and uh, uh, I am very grateful to be invited for this conference, um, especially in, in grateful because my English uh, uh, spoken English is not so good that my previous speakers and I s will switch to Polish. We agreed it with organizers that I will switch to Polish, to my native uh, language, uh, knowing that uh, majority of Ukrainians understand yeah, in Polish and uh, uh, of course our wonderful translators uh, translate to English uh, my uh, Polish words. And uh, mm, and I introduction in in my introduction, I, I also said that uh, I, I, I know uh, Spanish language. I, I don't know Spanish language. I, I uh, read only in English about uh, Spain, but uh, uh, I uh, found very uh, ins good inspiration in the article of Oksana Shevel which was published uh, uh, four or five years ago in Slavic Review, very deep, uh, very intellectual uh, comparison between the politics of memory in Ukraine and Spain. Mm, and uh, and uh, inspiring by that, I wrote uh, my own study about it, uh, about this topic. Uh, to some de degree, I will go this uh, way, yes, uh, tracing by Oksana, and this uh, article, uh, my article was uh, published in Ukraine, in Uk Ukraine, uh, because uh, Volodymyr Sklokin, who is uh, sitting in the last line, yes, uh, inspired me to uh, publish the whole book of my articles uh, and translated it into Ukrainian. But uh, unfortunately, I, I will <laughs> switch uh, to the Polish now, yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is with great interest that I've listened to what our uh, Spanish, what our Spanish uh, participants have told us, and I, perhaps in 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 summing up, I would like to perhaps say that there were two stages in the. Spanish uh, history of uh, the politics of memory. The first stage from 75 to roughly 2000, as, as we've heard, um, there was the Pacto del Olvido, the Pact of Oblivion, the Pact of Forgetting. There was the agreement in the Spanish elites with, uh, with, with, with the clear advantage of the interests of the right that those controversial antagonizing uh, topics for both uh, sides will not be discussed, will not be debated, uh, nor will be uh, persecuted uh, or tried. But this compromise, uh, this compact uh, fell apart and we have the second stage of the politics of memory which is continuing based on the uh, based on the socialist uh, uh, politics of memory, the, uh, the Zapatero government and as Oksana Shevel points out, it's, it, it rests on the concept that uh, there hasn't been a new narrative that's been imposed in place of the old narrative. It's not like in cancelling and removing those Francoist monuments that as we've seen uh, 
from the public space, the various tables and symbols, it's not like uh, it's not like a single Republican leftist n narrative has been introduced. No, it's more like the right to choose has been introduced. The right to choose, the right to choose the narration, the individual right to choose has been guaranteed in that space that uh, is, is being compared as far as uh, as far as uh, uh, installing leftist or rightist symbols and each individual would have the guaranteed right to know to know what happened with their relatives where they were buried um, that they could cultivate their memory that they could um, also choose choose which of the two sides in this conflict in this internal civil conflict which of these narratives uh, pr speaks to them more to uh, which which of these narratives are they more likely to support and though that's how what these two stages look like now the main thesis of my presentation is that neither of those stages uh, in the politics of memory had uh, any anything to do didn't didn't happen in ukraine it didn't, wasn't relevant in ukraine and now it's too late for it to be relevant in ukraine and so it's it's essentially it's impossible this second stage might happen but it will be decades before before it's possible at all moreover uh, all over europe east central europe uh, including poland including hungary including many of ukraine's neighbors the second stage of uh, spanish politics of memory uh, uh, resting on the uh, you know human rights guarantees is still impossible to implement um, and in focusing on this uh, politics of memory I would like to uh, point out the following distinction between Sp Spain and Ukraine uh, first of all uh, it's, which it should be noted that uh, you know Spain could be somewhat compared to Portugal there are only two uh, countries where the co collapse of dictatorship didn't mean uh, at the same time that the country became independent or at the same end to some big war uh, or, or the collapse of empire uh, in, 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 the, in the second half of the 20th century. It so happens that all other uh, unions in Europe that, that, uh, that, that are happening, especially in East Central Europe, but also the those those unions after the collapse of uh, communism but also those that had to do after the second world war in the case of uh, the axis states and their satellites all of them had that aspect where they found uh, found independence and the end of internal occupation and uh, the the you know the 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 the, 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 the you the collapse or end of a wartime uh, so perhaps the collapse of the third reich so which means that in all of those uh, all of those internal uh, unions in those countries we're looking at we're looking at uh, uh, external factors which affect the internal processes very strongly uh, consequently we don't have we don't have the kind of uh, lab conditions. We don't have the kind of ideal conditions that we had in Spain. Uh, specifically, the fact that, of course, we've seen, we've seen the Third Reich intervene to an extent. We had the Legion Condor. We had the fascist Italy that intervened. We had Soviet agents who intervened, uh, who were trying to help. But basically, in those countries, in those current countries, whereas Italy or Russia or or, 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 or Italy, not many people cared about what was happening in Spain. It was a kind of niche topic that will be interesting to those who are interested in military history, but not, not a serious political problem. In the case of Ukraine, of course, we're dealing with uh, a concept of historical controversy. Uh, Obviously, we're dealing with a new country that arose in 1991, and because of that, every internal process, every step in the internal process, internal reconciliation of Ukraine is dependent on what their neighbors will do, how they will comment or criticize or affect 
the internal story of Ukrainians uh, and the actions of Ukrainians. It's important to point out that, um, you know, against the backdrop of these conflicts, these internal conflicts in the concept, in the processes of reconciliation and union in, 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 in these countries, it a lot depends on whether or not those countries had a strong central orientation. What do I mean? I mean that in those countries where the uh, political centrum uh, was uh, democracy oriented, was uh, perhaps oriented at Anglo-Saxon countries in the Second World War and in the Cold War perhaps orienting to, to, the, to that side of the conflict. And if it was strong, if it dominated, at least dominated uh, the, the extreme left, the communists and extreme right and the integral inter nationalists and fascists through some extremely important part of the 20th century, then obviously that uh, conflict of memory is weaker, tends to be weaker. It's easier to reach agreement uh, based on the values represented by the broadly conceived center of politics. Obviously, in the case of Poland, we had the strong Pol London underground, the Armia Krajowa, the Home Army, the um, you know the parliamentary uh, democracy, the U European Union, or if we look at France, obviously the strong Gaullist uh, sec segment. And the resistance, the socialist, non non communist wing of the resistance. That's the example. The example of the Czech Republic, the Czechs. Obviously, reconciliation also has to do with uh, you know finding independence and the war. So obviously, there are also in external factors. Nevertheless, in those countries, the uh, falling back on this strong political centrum, this tradition of the strong political centrum, whose values have to do with also correspond to the. Uh, current values of the European Union, at least to a certain extent, that reconciliation is easier there. Ukraine is in a situation where that political centrum was weak, political center was weak. We were dealing with a strong communist orientation. We also had, uh, in the interwar year and in the Second World War, we also had a strong contra with a strong nationalist, in integral nationalist orientation opposed to Sovietism. and. Presently, we don't have we don't have a centrist tradition that uh, you know whatever the anti-Hitler co uh, coalition or the orientation to the West in the Second World War, which is why reconciliation is more difficult. Otherwise, the factors, the the, the internal identity factors in Ukraine are not promoting reconciliation. Uh, are more like a political result of. Uh, Reconciliation. Let's, for instance, look at the difference between Ukraine and the Baltic states. There is a clear um, distinction, a kind of identity distinction, identity boundary between you know the the autochthonous titular uh, nations, uh, whether Lithuanian or Latvian or Estonian, and the Russian speakers, uh, Russian speaking uh, citizens. That process of reconciliation really has to do only or almost only with Lithuanians themselves. So it's not between them and that minority. Nevertheless, that majority, that which can rule democratically, you know, by winning elections, uh, it has reached a certain internal consensus, a certain understanding, and as a consequence, it's uh, the a stable democracy is possible. Uh, a stable policy is possible. With the Ukrainian case, what we're dealing with that until recently, that that identity boundary between Western and Eastern Ukraine, and also between Ukrainianness and Russianness, was wasn't particularly clear. There weren't very clear ethnic criteria. So of course, this can lead to internal reconciliation. But at the same time, it, it might not. But at the same time, it doesn't help. Um, to crystallize a clear pro-democratic majority in that country, in those countries. I would like to say that, in my belief, the internal reconciliation in Spain, which... It, it's important to note that, um, you know, for Poles as well as for Ukrainians and the representatives of these nations and the historiographies, the intellectual elites of Eastern Europe, treat that Spanish, that first stage, 
uh, in Spanish in Spanish experience as uh, successful and that's the difference between what both of our Spanish uh, guests said today who are quite critical of it we think it was successful you know Poland has a lot of that sort of observations uh, and and uh, um, so I think in my opinion that that process it's worth to compare that process uh, there are some similarities first of all with the states that are historically similar to Spain what do I mean namely uh, countries that have a long tradition of statehood and that were Im empires in the past and such countries are obviously Spain, Portugal, as well as France was such a country, Great Britain was such a state, although their last internal conflict was in the 17th century, right? Uh, the Re Republican versus the Cavaliers, so it's um, quite a while back. But um, that sort of, those kind of countries, you could also compare it to Russia. It's also that sort of state that, you know, with a long historical tradition, it had an empire, that is the category. It's first of all, it's, it makes sense to compare the experience of, of Spain, at least in that first stage. The second category of states that it makes sense to compare Spain to are countries uh, from Central Europe, but also with a long historical tradition, such as Poland or Hungary. Uh, what unites those first two categories of uh, states? Well, uh, it's that we have the historiography but also society we have the belief in in the uh, we have this belief uh, thanks to the edu historical education it, it it's taken root in society and in political debate that there were many conflicts in the past and that we've managed to come out of them many times that society and that nation has succeeded in dealing with them many times whereas in russia there is that experience of smuta right of that of that um, crisis after which uh, some sort of consolidation also arrive, arrives. At the same time in Poland there are many of these examples of you know we, we teach the we teach the youth about them of the compromise of the Polish elites and emerging from the crisis so even with those first two categories of the countries it makes sense to compare to make these comparisons because really we have some sort of strong support for the uh, for the process of reconciliation and so I would say that in that first category the states with the strong uh, historical tradition and the long imp and the old imperial empires the comparison with Russia is intriguing because if you look at uh, if you look at Russia today we're, it's kind of like Spain after 75 if we're talking about symbolic space you know the monuments the tables the symbols it's just Stalin is missing Stalin's the only thing that's missing everything else is there um, it's it's very similar in that sense uh, only of course that there are also many differences the first of if which being that in Russia in 1991 there was no any kind of con contract in, in, in Spain, of course, there was a contract. There was the contract between political forces. So, nevertheless, there was some kind of democratic contract, which there wasn't in Russia. It just kind of happened, fell into place, that way this attempt at de-Sovietization failed in the 90s uh, under Yeltsin. And then that Soviet symbolic space uh, survived. And there's another distinction between, you know, Spain, Portugal, France, or the countries that that also had to go through these, and Russia, is that all of them cast away the idea of empire. They resigned, they gave it up, deciding that they're a national state. In the case of Russia, that decision was not made. Russia was fluctuating for a while between, you know, starting a, a you know a Russian national state or renovating the empire and it seems like the second choice has been made recently um, consequently those similarities are quite tenuous are quite su superficial um, 
if we're talking about the second category of, uh, of the countries like Hungary, uh, like I said, there's one similarity, one significant similarity is that in the case of Spain, in the intellectual tradition, in the historic intellectual tradition, there's the debate over whether or not uh, Spain can be a self-governing nation. I mean, may maybe they can't, and therefore they they, they can't. They're kind of a, they're also they are a failed state. Only dict dictatorship, you know, it's dictatorship and, and 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 civil civil war. Remember, in the 19th century, you have the first republic, then you have the monarchy, then you have Primo de Rivera's dictatorship, then you have the second republic, then you have the civil war, then you have the Franco dict dictatorship, and only now you have democracy from from that compact from that we discussed today. Uh, which started the first stage of the Spanish policy of memory. The second debate is, you know, is Spain, that long debate of is, is Spain able of governing itself? Is that a nation that is able of governing itself? The second debate is very, that long debate is very similar to what's going on in Spain. That emergence from communism, that, you know, finding a certain sovereignty, which is also very important. So, you know, the round table in 89 is an attempt to deny deny that kind of auto stereotypical um, per perception, you know, denial by by both sides, but also by communists uh, of that contract, and so that that reconciliation or that understanding, that kind of contract at the round table, which of course you can compare to an extent to the uh, Spanish Pact Pacto del Olvido was only there in Poland and Hungary. There were no other round tables in, East, in, in Eastern Europe. There were more revolutionary changes, whether we talk about uh, GDR or uh, Slovakia, Czechoslovakia. Uh, and it should be said that, you know, in Poland, the Spanish model, that first stage was discussed for a long time there were many attempts to, you know, uh, consciously model our behavior on it, but of course that it was an unwritten contract because there was no pact. It was an unwritten contact contract as to memories between the elites of both sides. It fell apart. It fell apart in the 1990s. Back in the 1990s, why did it fall apart? Well, probably because we're, we're talking about independence. First of all, it was about independence, not just about democracy and stabilization. But also because uh, those crimes perhaps were even worse and even greater scale than in the Spanish case. And of course they were cr done by somebody or provoked by somebody from outside. That moment of 1956 in Hungary, that Hungarian revolution, or the destruction of the partisan movement in Poland with the participation of the NKVD, NKVD uh, armies and the inter interior troops from the Soviets. Those are other kind of factors that we're dealing with than in the case of Spain. <coughs> and now, you know, reaching, talking about Ukraine, like Spain and Ukraine, I understand that uh, I am really testing your patience here. But I, 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 I hope to, you know, carry it for another five minutes then. Uh, so, to analyze, to take this to the end, to conclude that comparison between Ukraine and Spain, well, I think that in Ukraine, in 1991, you know, in a country that arose in those boundaries for the first time, Obviously, no contract was made as far as politics of memory. There weren't even really sides who could have made that contract. It, there weren't crystallized political forces that would represent segments of society to, that could potentially become signatories to such a contract. At the same time, obviously, Oksana Shevel was right, I think, when she was talking about that first stage you know, the presidency of Kravchuk, particularly, where there are many similarities, because, you know, the country didn't start an anti-Soviet uh, movement or de-Sovietization movement or any sort of movement that would, that would valorize the o o organization of Ukrainian nationalist or the Ukrainian um, uh, insurgent army that resisted the Soviets. So, yes, except that it was a policy that was manipulative. It was a policy that meant to preserve a unity, a state unity, between 
you know, the extreme left and the extreme right, the kind of the radical orientations of memory on either side of the political spectrum, which intended to obviously win another presidential election, you know, a kind of long wave, long term policy intending to uh, maintain a national or popular accord for the past. Now, I think in comparing in comparing Ukraine to Spain, I think we should think about three, three uh, fragments of uh, identity, national identity. First segment is the agreed interpretation of the longer his of the older history, including the 19th century, if it exists, and if it exists and it's uh, widespread in public consciousness, that is the first foundation. Now, the, 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 the difference is huge. I mean, Spain had such an established narration that has been told by this by the nation even before the dictatorship of Franco. There was broad-scale agreement and sub subsequently it was then told increasingly so during the dictatorship that largely consolidated, consolidated the Spanish society, not in the sense that uh, in the sense that it was a national state. It was a consolidation as a national state. In the Ukrainian case we have this we do have this interpretation of history, at least in the figure of Hrushevsky and his history. But nevertheless, it only entered the mass consciousness in the, in the 1990s, right? So the first kind of um, fragment, segment, is only built in mass consciousness in the 1990s, in the first presidencies of, of independent Ukraine. I mean, that's a pretty positive aspect, um, you know, of uh, Kravchuk or Kuchma. Now, the second aspect is the agreed narration as to the 20th century, the conflicts from the 1930s through the 1980s, the Second World War, communism. Now, in Spain, they decided not to, not to mention them because they figured that they will enter into a conflict that they will not emerge from. But they started based on that first fund foundation, the first segment, they started building the third one. And the third one is, you know, achieving economic, political, stabilizatory successes that obviously have to do with the inter integrating into the EU and NATO, uh, NATO and, you know, not, without, so without, without, you know, they left the second segment alone and they built the third one. In the case of Ukraine, this did not occur. The second one was not touched. It wasn't even tried politically. But the successes in the third segment were not reached either. Only the first segment was um, reached. And in this sense, in, in that condition, Ukraine reaches the year of 2014. In 2014, as you all know, fundamental things have happened, such that lead me to conclude as a historian uh, to look at the histo history of Ukraine in the categories of the process of nation building. Obviously the end stages of that process, but nevertheless in that way. So it's not in the way of according to which we accent, you know, human rights or individual rights or rights to choose or memory like it's done, which is po which was possible in Spain in the second stage of this politics of memory, except in the way where we're constantly talking about integration about identity politics and identity act action in of society and uh, statehood that's what's happening and consequently the politics of memory after the revolution obviously it has different features on the one hand you could say that uh, that statehood that ukrainian statehood has agreed clear cl clarity about sovietism or has kept itself much like the Poles and the Balts in the second stage from the late 1990s. It has definitely reached that. We're not talking about any compromise, any contact about uh, memory, about the previous conflicts, but it has not reached clarity about integral Ukrainian nationalism. There is no clarity that the whole time it is it is constantly getting ready for it to happen. That's my interpretation. So I will state that when Ukrainians then build the third stage, which they are building, which they are doing now, they will reach, I don't know, in a few years or umpteen years,
then they will reach a point to discuss the um, possibly the way to discuss the second stage, the the, the crimes of the uh, of the twentieth century, uh, and it might turn out that one totalitarianism, the Soviet one, and both the second totalitarianism, that kind of integral nationalist, w inspiring itself through fascism to an extent will both be treated from the both point of view as totalitarian regimes leading to the same results. But for that you have to first build the third stage. Because you because you have to you have to you need two points to rest upon. Not 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 one and not zero, which was the case until nineteen ninety one. For this reason I am very decided to convince you, ladies and gentlemen, to be patient, including the Polish historians, to be patient with regard to Ukrainian politics of memory. I apologize for the long presentation, and I thank you for your, for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really grateful to all the three speakers for their presentations, for their very interesting papers. And I want to remind you that our speakers, in particular our Spanish colleagues, drew a very realistic picture. I don't think that is a false picture. I think that um, outlined a very plausible picture of the situation with the politics of memory in Spain. Uh, what strikes me most in this context <coughs> is the different stages, the different phases that the politics of memory evolved through in Spain and this is something that was profoundly described in Professor Casanova's presentation. There's one thing that I really liked and this is something that I want to highlight. Professor Casanova uh, talked uh, about uh, uh, Franco's idea and his approach to the politics of memory, in particular this monument in the Valley of the Fallen and he talked in great detail about the developments uh, in the post-Franco uh, period after the death of Franco and the response of the society to all the developments at that time. And I think that there is a number of um, aspects that deserve our attention uh, based on Professor Casanova's presentation and as well as uh, Professor Seychash's presentation, we can see that the key agents um, of change in the politics of memory uh, were civil society organizations, initiative groups, non-governmental organizations, uh, family members of the fallen ones of the victims that um, exhumated the um, remnants of um, their dear ones bodies uh, and this way they tried and did their best to influence the political situation, they demanded change. There's one more thing that I would like to draw your attention to, and this is something that we might um, subject to discussion later. This is something that was well overviewed um, during one conference in uh, Warsaw uh, last year, and it was uh, dedicated to the transitional justice this is the topic that was touched upon by our German colleagues and it was also briefly um, mentioned in our Spanish presentations. At that conference, um, a lot of the participants and speakers were very critical about the definition, interpretation and essence of the concept of transitional justice, but I think that this issue is much more profound than it might seem at first sight. And uh, finally, uh, one of the key statements and premises that I singled out from our um, Spanish presentation, what we should do in this situation. By we, I mean um, the representatives of the academia, uh, professors, historians, so what should our role be in this um, uh, discourse. I think uh, that um, in Ukraine uh, we also have the clash of uh, these discourses, maybe this um, clash is uh, uh, more latent than in Spain. And now I also want to highlight some points from the third presentation that we um, have been present presented. Um, Mr. 
Professor Striek um, communicated his vision of the situation, uh, but there is one reservation that I want to make. Uh, some of the speeches before that and uh, uh, Tomasz's speech um, uh, expressed this opinion of uh, the disposition of the clash between Eastern and Western Ukraine. What about Central Ukraine? Where is the place of Central Ukraine? Uh, because um, uh, there are a lot of publications on the fact that there's no linguistic uh, or uh, geographic uh, division between the west and the east of Ukraine or any other parts of Ukraine, that it's uh, uh, more of a mental division, uh, mental um, fracture. Uh, so uh, we can... Uh, once again, I want to reiterate, so it's not about a geographic clash or geographic division. And finally, the three key stages uh, that Professor Striek um, highlighted, uh, I think this is something that should be communicated up to our president and our top state leadership because uh, this experience might be of value to them so uh, all the three papers were very interesting and stimulators and i'm sure that you have numerous questions so we're ready for questions uh, thank you very much um, uh, professors um, for your interesting presentations don't worry i will ask my question in ukrainian i just wanted to make this introduction in spanish well, but we, we got it. We got that part, even if it was even though it was in in Spanish. Before Zapatero uh, came to office, uh, they said that the terminology around the civil war and um, around the FICOIS was that it was collective uh, craziness. So my question is as follows: What are the terms used by the left forces, uh, socialist uh, parties, and the right wing parties, uh, the Catholic Church? And one more question: Is there some sort of dynamics? in the position of the Catholic Church with regard to the civil war and Franco's dictatorship. One more question, are there any regional differences in terms of attitudes uh, to the politics of memory, for example, in Catalonia, in the Basque country, and how is that linked to the separatist ideas? Uh, these are the questions to our two Spanish professors. Um, I think that we can hear a couple of more questions, maybe like four questions total, and then our speakers will start answering. Martin, you're welcome. I have two sets of questions. Well, two questions that have a, a lot of uh, side issues. Um, first of all, uh, uh, our, our previous panel started with a, a reference to Hannah Arendt. Uh, and the role of diasporas, refugees, exiles. Uh, is, were some countries or some societies better prepared because they had a long-standing exile community who was able, debating, I, mean, I know the Spanish Civil War had people in Mexico, in, in Soviet Union, in France, a lot of them. So these debates were happening already there. And, and in the Polish case, I mean, I, I got to know the Kultura people in Jerzy, Gedroyd's having a discussion in Paris about the future of Poland, which included Polish-Ukrainian relations, Polish-Jewish relations. So that's one set of questions. What is, I mean, uh, again, diasporas are going to play different roles, or refugee populations or exile populations will play different roles in each of these cases, but it seems that there might be some generalization you could make about the role of diasporas or exile populations in these uh, <coughs> confrontations with the past and, and framing of the uh, discussion of the past. The second question uh, had to do with, Tomas raised the question of imperialism. And some of you know I have a kind of bugbear <coughs> about imperialism. And, and in the case of Spain, it seems to me that there would be some kind of a connection between Spanish attitudes toward the Jewish population, and the Jewish question comes up in Spain in the, from the Inquisition and the Conversos problem. Uh, Muslims in Spain uh, is another sort of minority that had to also have some kind of uh, reconciliation or restitution. And then the empire in, in, in Latin America where uh, Spaniards, 
have also very different reputations in Puerto Rico, which I know better. Spaniards, c colonialism was a good thing for, for some people, but in Mexico, uh, Christopher Columbus is not a hero, but a villain. So uh, to what degree did the, the Latin American discussion of the Spanish empire uh, and its dark legacies uh, and, and the reputation of Spain, uh, especially by British historians who tended to present the Spanish Empire as, of course, less progressive and less enlightened than the British Empire. To what degree does that enter into the dis discussion about the Civil War and the sides there? So, stop with that. Frank so, uh, Just a, a short commentary on these comparisons. Uh, and uh, they're always good and they're always false in, as we do them. So it's frequent to compare uh, Ukraine to Catalonia and uh, Russia to Castile, that is, in one set of things. That is, the more European place, place closer to Europe, the place that served as a transmission belt. Uh, and at least historically, uh, the first great interest we get in Spain and vice versa in Ukraine comes in the 17th century. That is, the Kolitsky forces know about the role to the Catalans and are interested. Uh, the Spanish Madrid court is going to support Warsaw in that battle. So we see very early contact in, in, in those contexts. Uh, context. Uh, uh, it strikes me on the comparisons of, of, of Spain and Ukraine today, and I think it's come up with some of these questions, in many ways Spain is the more fragile country. That is, uh, Spain doesn't really have a panstva narodove. It has a, it's never formed a Spanish nation fully. It now, and I leave it to my Spanish colleagues to answer me back and show me why this doesn't work. It's going to face a much more difficult time now trying to sort out its nationality issues. And then Ukraine is, despite this divide of, of what might be called a, a Russian world in one part of Ukraine, but I think Ukraine is much more uniform than Spain is culturally and even politically in many ways, and that Spain is in, 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 in essence going to have to sort this out as well as the issues we brought out. Uh, and then uh, on a more direct question uh, to our Spanish colleagues, to what degree was uh, Franco viewed as, in the end, an acceptable transition. That is, he kept Spain out of great bloodshed during World War II, whatever we viewed the war of now and where Spain should have been. He let, he in the end carried on policies that at least brought the bases of modernization of Spanish society and economy. Uh, it, was that, does that play at all? One, is that argument made? And two, uh, does it hold any water? That is, uh, is it at all justified and does it play any role today? Прошу, Ярослав, і ми починаємо відповіді. Okay, you know, one other thing on the Ukrainian-Spanish thing. Of course, Ukrainians fought on both sides of the civil war. There were units that came from here that fought, uh, fought on the nationalist side. And uh, the uh, legions that came to fight on the Republican side also came uh, to a large degree from the Ukrainians in North America who fought on the other side. So Ukrainians were on both sides of the Spanish civil war. Not huge numbers, but at least they were appreciable at that time. Прошу, mm Ярослав. -hmm. I would like to step. I would like to step. I would like to follow the steps of the of Frank Sisson, and as, but I start with rather pity that uh, Jan Kubik is not here, because in his uh, book, he uses the kind examples, but doesn't use the kind of model as an approach, mm -hmm. so to say. And in, but in this by this token, I, I would rather say, but it's probably again okay, tomorrow. I don't really believe this kind of Spanish model, but there is Spanish approach like. <coughs> like what Kuchma did, like what Kravchuk did, like what Adenauer did at the very beginning. When you have a society which is deeply divided, which is traumatized, when you have a facing transition, you apply some matter of, of, of amnesia, so to say. So what my question is, hmm. let's indul indulge in the contrafactual history. What would happen if there would be no pact of amnesia in 1975? What would happen to Spain? So my impression is that I don't really see here criteria upon which we could judge successfulness or not successfulness of the political historical memory. I don't believe political historical memory is, is a uh, things per se. Mm -hmm. It's rather instrument to some aim, and the aim is political transition. 
So this is my <coughs> question. What would happen then if there'll be no pack amnesia on 75? Yaroslav, it's addressed to all or to Spanish? Is it a question to everyone or just to the Spanish colleagues? Yes, we could write a, a doctoral dissertation about these uh, deep questions. No, I, I would like to stress three or four related to the topic, to the today's topic. First, um, historiography about the Spanish Civil War and uh, the dictatorship is in good health. That means that any educated person could read everything, everything, solid uh, propaganda, everything about the Spanish Civil War. You go to novels, literature, the situation is the same. If you go to documentaries, films, the famous international films about this, and so it's a good health. The other side is the side of the social dimension, the disputes, the fightings, the role of the media, the political use and abuse of the past. And so in that sense, we are confronted very contradictory things. For instance, talking about the Catholic Church. At the same time, the families were looking for the missing, the Catholic Church and the Vatican were beatified hundreds of martyrs in the Vatican mm, with the media spreading around the world hundreds and hundreds of Martyrs. Well, this is a, a tension that is very striking in the democracy. Okay, and then, and finally, I don't think there is a relationship between this lack of truth and the quality of democracy in Spain. The vices, weaknesses of democracy in Spain are our weaknesses and uh, mm, our in the sense the civil society in the last years. To put the blame on the transition is very easy, but it doesn't, it doesn't confront eh, the relationship between history and the present. And so in my opinion, and finally, um, the transition, well, counterfactual or um, virtual history. I mean, the role of the army, this is the main difference between Greece, uh, Portugal, and Spain. The role of the army, the presence of the army, the United Army had blocked at that moment any possibility any possibility of confronting the past in other uh, in other way. That's the main difference between Portugal and Spain. That's the main difference between Greece and Spain. And so, when people are talking now about uh, we had to confront the past in other way, well, after 40 years of dictatorship, people wanted to vote. After 40 years of dictatorship, people wanted to uh, be in the municipalities, in the regional governments. The parties on the left, at the end of the 70s, were not talking about memory or crimes. And besides, at the end of the 70s, Pinochet just had started, or had just started. Videla was after Franco in South Africa. Uh, in South Africa, the apartheid was uh, still in force, and in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Europe, uh, there were plenty of dictatorships. And so, when people think that uh, we did something wrong at the end of the 70s, at the end of the 70s, universal human rights was not a topic, was not a subject, uh, and you can 
and you can see the newspapers, the historiography, everything in comparative perspective, and you can realize that we are mixing plenty of things. At the end, I defend that knowledge, research, archives eh, are in a direction and disputes, fightings, the media are in other direction. And by the way, and finally, education is very important. How to educate people in history. How this kind of knowledge goes to the schools, to the high schools. This is a big subject, a big topic, and there is no consensus about this in Spain. There is no consensus about how to teach history of the 20th century in Spain. And this is a key factor for the future generations, in my opinion. Well, I mostly agree with uh, Professor Casanova's statements, and, and I also agree on the fact that uh, we should write something like 20 PhD dissertations and to answer, to definitely answer the questions which have been posed. Some of the questions relate to each other, so I will try to be brief. First, uh, the terminology which actually relates to the image of Franco as a modernizer, as of Franco as someone who had prepared, who had paved the way for democracy in the 1950s and 1960s, where actually the Spanish Civil War was first regarded, or regarded by the winners as a crusade, and was regarded as a national crusade against Bolshevism, against ethics, against, free, against Freemasonry, etc., etc. By the losers, it was seen as a national war of independence or a revolution, or as a revolutionary war of independence. And in fact, the communists saw the civil war as a war against a foreign enemy, against the fascist powers. Then in the 1950s and 1960s, democratic opposition and exile, particularly the diaspora, began to think about the civil war in other terms, began to reflect about collective madness, but also about the necessity of coming to a national reconciliation. The first party, which actually put forward the necessity of uh, overcoming the legacy of the Spanish Civil War was the Communist Party in 1956. So, and the first conversion of the, or the first uh, agreement between the sons of the winners and, or the children of the winners and the children of the losers took place in the 1950s and the 1960s. So there were many initiatives going on, uh, both at the cultural level in, or at the cultural level, both in, within Spain and outside. So in this sense, there is an evolution of the terminology of the Spanish Civil War, which is related to this change of perceptions. And actually, it is very important to remember and to forget Civil War or a war. How do you label it? And obviously, in the 1970s, uh, everyone referred to the Spanish Civil War as a collective tragedy, as a madness. But I mean, the, this tendency came both from the left and from the right. And in Anglo American historiography as well. 50 50 position, no? Yeah. Put the blame on but, both yeah but, not, but not only this. I mean, there were reflections about the, the collective madness which had pushed Spain towards the catastrophe, <coughs> coming from the exile as well. And uh, post Franco is the late Franco's historians also stressed this aspect. Uh, the territorial approach, uh, territorial difference, yes, they are important, they are ambiguous. Uh, to put it simply, um, there is a selective memory of the Spanish Civil War and Francoism, which is also put forward or defended by uh, Basque, Catalan, or Galician nationalists, where they tend to shadow, they tend to hide the collaboration of many of their activists and leaders with the Franco regime because they were uh, strongly anti-communist, so they chose Franco, they chose the Franco side as the, least, as the lesser evil, uh, 
while uh, those sectors, those branches, those parties which actually took arms against the Francoists for the Republic or only for their self-government are obviously, are obviously stressed and, and, and are obviously celebrated. This is a long topic, but I mean the idea now hold, uh, now held and now sustained in public by many uh, nationalist leaders and historians in the periphery is that the civil war was not only a war between the left and the right, it was also a war of Castile against Catalonia, the Basque Country, Galicia and the like, uh, and which is actually a simplification, an extreme simplification. Uh, whether this has a, whether this relates to present day uh, separate extensions, particularly in Catalonia, of course it does, and uh, particularly the Catalan regional government has always been very active in promoting anti-fascist memory as a legitimizing argument, although they tend to hide collaboration or the fact that many conservative Catalonists were also among the best and most uh, generous financiers and donators to the Francoist cause. Uh, what about uh, whether Ukraine can be compared to Catalonia, Russia can be compared to Castile, yeah, everything can be compared to everything. Uh, Present-day Catalan, some factions of present-day Catalan nationalists regard uh, Eastern Ukrainian Russian separatists with some sympathy because now they consider to see Kiev at the center of power and uh, Russian people from Crimea and uh, et cetera as Russian-speaking people. Uh, as uh, the true patriots and Putin as someone who defends the interests of the fatherland. So depends very much on who is the b bad guy, who is, uh, who is the good guy. This is not this question. The question is who is stronger, who is weaker, and what is convenient for internal purposes, for internal propaganda purposes. Uh, whether Spain is a fragile nation state or failed nation state, this is a long discussion in Spanish historiography and nationalist studies. I tend not to hold the view of Spain as a failed nation building because most European nation buildings are in fact failed nation buildings. I mean, we are all fascinated by the French model, by Eugene Weber's view of France, uh, peasants into Frenchmen as the model, as the, uh, path to follow, and actually France is the exception rather than the usual, the paradigm in European history. So I don't really think Spain is more failed than Great Britain, than uh, Italy in many respects, Canada or Belgium. And uh, lots, and think about big nationalist, uh, uh, national uh, state-led nationalists like the Polish one, now the Ukrainian and the German one, they lost territories, they have experienced transfer of populations, uh, they have experienced occupation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, th there could be many points to touch upon, but I think, uh, yes, coming to your last point, I mean, of what would have happened, I totally agree. I mean, I think there was no o other option. And it was perhaps a wise decision. And it's very easy to, for, for us to judge, to make a judgment or to make a statements about which, this, which possibilities did people in the past have, which choices did they have. They had no choice. I mean, the, uh, the story of Spanish transition was, in my view, quite simple. Is, uh, some people had the power but had no legitimacy. Democratic opposition had legitimacy but didn't have the power. So they came quite easily to an agreement. I mean, post Francois needed legitimacy, which was only given, which was only afforded by the democratic opposition. Democratic opposition necessitated power to change things. There was a, uh, <coughs> there was a question about the exile, the exile. Yes, well, I think that uh, if you realize that almost half million people crossed the French border in less than two months at the beginning of 1939, 
Of course, there is this image compared with the refugees, and, and in Spain there are plenty of consciousness about exile eh, in some sectors of the society. And finally, I think also there is a lesson in the way, in, in spite of the corruption, the quality of democracy, there is also a lesson in the way Spain treated, eh, adopted almost five million of immigrants at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century. And in spite of the crisis, a severe crisis with more than 25% of unemployment, in spite of the corruption, there was no xenophobic political movement, xenophobic political party, ultra-rightist political movement, anti-immigrant. And so I, I think we, we, we are in, in a very contradictory country in many aspects. And at the end, only knowledge going outside, comparing Spain with other societies, we realize that in fact, eh, we are confronting many, many problems that other societies are confronting as well. There is no model, universal model, and the rest exceptional. No, I think the, the debates about exceptionalism in the Spanish history um, produce a lot of historiography, but at the end, at the end, we are very, very similar to other historiographies. Just a, just a, a very short remark to this question I had forgotten. Uh, well, actually, one of the prizes of uh, the obsession of memory uh, of the recent past is the oblivion of the dark sides of the Spanish past before Francoism and before the Second Spanish Republic. And we don't still have a serious discussion concerning our colonial past. Not only the remote colonial past, I'm not only talking about America in the 16th and 17th centuries. I'm also talking about uh, Western Sahara until 75, uh, Equatorial Guinea in the 20th century, or Cuba and Puerto Rico, many faces, many dark uh, sides of the colonial wars in northern Morocco, etc. I mean, this still has to be a, a discussion as it has been uh, launched uh, some years ago in German historiography concerning the colonial origins of the Holocaust and genocide, whatever its result may have been, has still to be launched in Spanish historiography. Well, I am in the pleasant situation that many answers have been already exhausted. Uh, I'm in the advantageous situation that many answers have already been given, but I do have a few remarks uh, to say. And I'll start by saying that, um, you know, we were talking just recently about why this Spanish uh, politics of memory could not immediately have rested on the criteria of human rights or... Uh, well, the answer was, well, of course it couldn't have been, because in the 1970s, Professor Casanova said this, in the 1970s, that wasn't a topic in the political debate, in the public debate. That approach wasn't there. The Cold War was, you know, full on, in full blast. You know, the international security, the stability of military blocs, uh, Spain joining NATO, NATO, you know, um, uh, you know, keeping Spain from a kind of Portugal, Portuguese scenario where, you know, the leftists wanted to leave NATO. Um, but. You know, if you want somebody wants to read about it in English, they should read the article by Oksana Shavel. Everything's really laid out there that we've discussed. If somebody wants to read about it in Ukrainian, they can read it my article because it was published in Ukrainian. They're slightly different, but they agree in the essential things. Uh, I, I follow in Oksana's footsteps, basically. Uh, we agree in the essentials. Uh, I would also like to briefly state, um, as, as, far, as far as the role of immigration that you mentioned, um, well, we find ourselves in this place, in Ukrainian Catholic University, that to an extent shows, shows the role of the Ukrainian diaspora in the process of you know, uh, affecting the country and affecting uh, national unity. 
as you as you see now I'm a guest but I'll act a bit like a host I apologize if I'm uh, violating some delicate balance here but as we know across that room is a is a, is, a, is a board of donators and, and people who have donated money who are they they're mostly big people from Ukraine diaspora now this conference about union is happening largely thanks to them because obviously the the support for this university um, so it's not just you know the Polish case of Gedroic but also the Ukrainian case can be cited here and so as far as uh, the very interesting comparisons um, I mean, has nation building succeeded or failed? To what extent are European nations integrated? What are the differences between Western and Central Eastern Europe? Uh, the mentions that the remarks by Professor Sisson were very relevant. But I'll start that, you know, to compare Catalonia and Ukraine and Castile and Russia, which uh, Professor Seychas has, has perhaps doubted, has put in doubt, or said that there are other possible comparisons, but I would like to say that in Ukrainian political thought and historical reflection, it's a very profoundly rooted uh, comparison. If we look at Olget uh you know, the interwar social democrat, um, <clears throat> you know, the kind of liberal democratic uh, sociologist, you know, he looks at the uh, nation forming processes in 2030 i mean in in of obviously in ukraine and catalonia i mean there's a long history of these comparisons what i'm saying and i agree that that uh, comparison works now to what extent those nations are or aren't integrated well in those two parts of europe in western and eastern europe i think that professor sisson and professor Seychus are right obviously spain is not profoundly integrated internally or is not a country that is integrated internally profoundly we see in uh, great britain and we've recently had the scottish referendum we see some kind of uh, you know kind of uh, dissolution of that statehood of that state nation but but in east central europe it seems that we're paradoxically uh, looking at uh, much more homogenized nations not just for the french also the poles Okay, we do have the Silesian movement, but it's not great. It's that they're very homogenized, uh, including the Baltic states, you know, the titular, the titular nations of the Baltic states, or the Hungarians. I mean, we're talking about minorities who have never been integrated in those countries, but those titular nations are profoundly integrated. It's, it looks stronger than, you know, the Brits or the, or the Spaniards. Why? Well, history. I mean, the empire, the threats to independence, deportation, uh, genocide, bloodlands. That is the factor that has affected, uh, profoundly affected, that they uh, are what they are. It doesn't mean they will always be like that. That dissolution of nations, which maybe is happening in Spain, may also happen in Poland or in Ukraine, which is actually joining those profoundly integrated uh, nations in the, in the recent years. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, we're entering a dangerous area and we might lose lose the dinner for, our, for the participants of the conference. And as Yaroslav said in a nice place, but if there's the will by Yaroslav and Nora, uh, are we continuing for a bit longer? Okay, okay, three more questions and that's it. Three, three. Uh, it's your, 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 you and then Yosef, yes. Thank you for this opportunity and for the opportunity to say a few words. These are not, but I ask you to please formulate briefly. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be brief. So, the I thank you for the presentations, um, the, the, kind of the Spanish uh, variation of memory, they were quite instructive and for me it was this first conclusion that, you know, I fully agree with all the conclusions but I don't agree with the way it was presented. Because when we're talking about the Spanish experience, I support Professor Casanova here, we have to remember that there's history, there's policy, and there's journalism, and you shouldn't always conflate them. It's very e bad when politicians, you know, uh, 
push on the political part of it. When we're talking about discussions about historical memory in modern Spain, it has two things. First of all, it's a political discussion that is built on the basis of a very old idea of two Spains, one that is right and one that is wrong, one that is bad and one that is good. Um, historiography is stepping away from this thesis. And finally, the question, no, no, this is not a question yet. This is just a few more. So finally, when we're talking about memory, let's remember a few things. First of all, memory is fluid. When we're talking about, let's say, the memory of the Civil War, should not we start by saying those same participants of uh, Civil War had their own memory? And Professor Seychas will know this better because he's presented this in his texts about these national myths, nationalist myths of the Civil War that uh, both the right and the left had. But also, we shouldn't uh, start the discussion about memory you know, by starting, I don't know, from uh, July 1936, because the Civil War had had a previous period during the Second uh, Republic. And so this was very difficult. Okay, yes, it was mentioned. Yes, yes, Rivera's dictatorship was mentioned. So when we're talking about a uh, indifferent society, we're talking about the switch to democracy. Um, I also agree that, uh, that this pact had something else than simply to unite the bourgeois projects, uh, the left and the right, to create some form of... Uh, to, 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 to bring some people to power. I, I would go to Paloma Aguilar here, who referred to Paloma Aguilar, who has spoken in some of her texts that all of the participants of the Pact of uh, Pacto de Olvido uh, had their own uncomfortable paths. And it's not just the right, but also the left that had things to forget. And to continue this, I will mention the Stanley Payne thesis that, you know, the Socialist Worker Party uh, in Spain is the only great party that has not revised, that has not given a... Please, the question. Please be specific. I, that's, that's the question. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Josip. Just, just a second. Josip Jesus. Yeah. Thank you uh, for this presentation. It was very interesting, but I, I can't feel uh, that we. I, I don't feel like we can let borrow much from this in our Ukrainian reality. I understand, Mr. Shapoval, that I have to be brief. But when you're listening to the whole day and thinking, okay, now give give it to me quickly, it's not so easy. That's the talent. Well, I'll start maybe with an unusual question, an expected question. We're often asked sometimes. We are sometimes asked, you know, if two years ago, if you knew how this would end, if you knew about the heavenly hundred, if you knew about the victims during the war that we're seeing now, and from Russia's aggression, would you have started the movement in the Maidan? I don't think it's a correct question, but we're trying to say, well, could we have done any differently? Could we have not come out? But I would like to ask uh, maybe one of the uh, speakers, one of the professors who would defend the more of a leftist uh, point of view, can they answer this question? Had the Republicans known what their uh, arrival in authority would have, uh, would have ended, would they have started uh, if they knew that it would be like a half a million of uh, victims and 40 years of dictatorship. It seems that we're living in different civilizations. It's not even an impression, it's, it's a surety that we live in different civilizations because you've experienced the Spanish, you've experienced the right dictatorship, 40 years of right dictatorship that killed half a million people. But as a result, you're now in the European uh, Union, in the European uh, democratically and economically quite a developed countries. We've, developed, we've experienced 70 years of a leftist dictatorship and we see no end to the consequences of this dictatorship that we've had for 70 years and that has been gone for 25 years, but we're still dealing with its consequences to this day. And we don't see our civilized future uh, clear, there's no clear vision at all. And so I would like I'm not comparing dictatorships, I'm not comparing right and left dictatorships, they're both ugly and they're very different, but dictatorships are always ugly because repression is ugly. Um, but Mr. Shapoval said that he saw two discourses. I didn't really see, maybe I missed something. I saw one discourse. Uh, I'm missing, um, for instance, that aspect of memory that was cultivated during the Franco dictatorship. So when they were uh, looking into the crimes by the Republicans, 
and there were enough of those in, in, in the war. I mean, a lot of people died, what, about a hundred thousand on every side? I mean, and, and total losses, well, where, where's the rest? So, and there was also bombardment of peaceful towns. I mean, the Soviet planes and the Soviet pilots uh, sitting them were bombarding towns that were not under Republican power. I mean, I understand that they're different because, for example, the national dictatorship during the war used sexual violence over women, but, but the Republican dictatorship killed almost 7,000 7, priests. I mean, this is a very difficult comparison, but whenever I'm lacking when I, I'm, I'm lacking the uh, equilibrium in this policy of memory. Where is this equilibrium? Where is this balance? Both had victims, both perpetrated crimes. And so if the Socialist Party, as our colleague said, has still not revised its, uh, its basics, its, its, its foundations, then what uh, are we talking about? And finally, the final thing I wanted to say is that, you know, um, this war was largely a civil war, overwhelmingly a civil war, even though there were external factors on both sides. Our war is, whenever we look at it, whether in 1918 or 1939 or 1941, it was never a civil war. It was mostly an external aggression, even though they were, you know, Muravyov in 1918 or the Soviet, the Red Army in 39 or now when Russia is meddling in this. So we can't really look at our problems as a civil war, even though certain aspects are there. But this is more of a collaborationism that is taking the side of the outward external aggressor. And this also what let us uh, take on that model, that model of the memory of uh, politics and memory. We have to work out our own, of course, knowing what you've done, taking that into account. Thank you. And the final question for today's session, yes, please. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Okay, I'll ask in English. I have a very quick question to our Spanish colleagues and then a question to Thomas. So um, my question is going to be sort of a flip side of Professor Sisson's uh, question, um, in a way, which country is more united, Spain or Ukraine? Because um, when we, when sometimes when I try to present my work on the Spanish-Ukrainian comparison, the question from the audience would actually be similar to what you were saying, um, to the fact that in Spain it was conflict between brothers. In other words, whether you are Republican or whether you are Francoist, you were still Spanish, and there was no question that there was sort of conflicting views about the vision of Spain or the history of Spain. If we try to think of sort of Ukrainian parallel, the the, the argument would go uh, to the fact that people um, or groups or historians who advocate the sort of more Soviet narrative, they're really advocating for something other than Ukraine. They're advocating for some renewed version of Soviet Union, some sort of Slavic Union, and so forth. So that's the argument. Uh, my question is whether or not you would agree that in Spain, this conflict between these two narratives is really kind of internal conflict within this larger collectivity of Spain, which is not being questioned, or is it, and this is something that came in your comments and also the impression I got from some of the research that I have done, that the opponents were presented as anti-Spanish, as enemies of Spain, as is not really Spanish, right? So if you are like a red traitor, that by definition excludes you from the Spanish nation, and if you are not part of the nation, then therefore I think the parallel would hold with places like Ukraine, where again you would say if you are on one side, you are sort of anti-Ukrainian, right? So that that's my question to Spanish colleagues. And my question to Thomas, you ended on this quite optimistic note that sort of basically saying that, you know, we should just wait and the things will work themselves out, that Ukraine mm -hmm. would eventually, after Euromaidan, would reach the point, you know, where, you know, Spain maybe is or other West, West European countries, whereby both totalitarian narratives, you know, or, or nationalist, you know, sort of Soviet and nationalist totalitarian past is being deconstructed. I wanted to ask you what gives you this optimism, and maybe you can say just a few words more of how do you envisage this happening, and what about the alternative possibility? Because one could argue, I'm not necessarily saying I agree with this, but just for the sake of argument, that actually, um, is it too fast or what? Uh, that, okay, that actually after, I'm trying to, you know, be concise, that after Euromaidan, 
um, in, in the current situation, it's actually maybe less likely that, say, the nationalist narrative will be deconstructed because there is no longer a strong opposition on the sort of, you know, pro-Soviet, whatever, pro-Russian, you want to call it, right? We actually see, if we look at legislation that's adopted, for example, the decommunization law, there is no, no like, semblance of deconstruction of this sort of, you know, glorification of the UNO and UPA and so forth and acknowledgement that in addition to fighting for independence, they also maybe committed some things that are less glorious, right? So I was wondering if you could say just in a couple of words, like what gives you this optimism? Like how do you exactly see this process going forward by itself? <coughs> uh, thank you very much for this question, Oksana. Um, what gives me grounds for optimism? This is a tricky question, but I think that um, it's the belief that those are the general regularities of the development of nation building and state building. So it's the long-term long-term development I'm talking about the three the three uh, segments that you know you can you can rest on two and then build the third one later but you can't rest on one or zero but as far as I know I know for sure I know exactly what Banyuk San is talking about which is the new decommunization laws of that kind of lopsided one-sided narration narrative that one-sided narrative in society in Ukrainian society which seems it seems like it has won the day, like it's carrying the day. So, I want to say that it's winning in the eternal, all around Ukraine, also in neighboring Ukraine. In, in, in Russia, it has certainly won the kind of neo imperial narrative. In Poland, I mean, we're looking at a big turn to the right, very clear. In, in Poland, we're dealing with uh, nine ambassadors, nationalist ambassadors, and uh, nine uh, delegates in the same for the first time since 2015. Uh, in Poland, we have a growing movement of uh, to to uh, to hero to, to to valorize the post-war partisans who are some very some of whom are very doubtful morally for moral. So trying to valorize them is i mean and also the, so the whole region has this tendency has this tendency to this trend that of course is also acting on ukraine now in the ukrainian polish uh, c c communication those attempts to valorize are, are seen by the other side as uh, something to you know well they're they're you know they're also they're also taking their own villains to make and valorize them and so that's why well, if they're doing that, then why should we re refuse our own heroes? So it's mutual. Now, in the short term, I'd like to say, yes, we have reasons to be pessimistic, but in the long term, I'm sure there are reasons to be optimistic, except in the long term, this means that Russia has to change. Without a change in Russia, without a change in Russia, sure, sure, my optimism has, there's no reason for it. Sure. In Poland, perhaps it's easier to believe that this uh, tendency will stop. Maybe it's easier to believe that. Although recently, again, as, as participants of uh, public life in Poland, we're looking at whether that tendency of the strong arm, the strong hand, that nationalization, that you know, national narrative, has it not uh, prevailed for the longer term? We don't know. Thank you. Well, uh, I don't know how to be very short, but I want... I want to try to do my best. Yes, referring to the two last questions, uh, internal aggression, external aggression, civil war, uh, external war. Uh, certainly, it is not only a, a specificity of the Spanish civil war, but it's characteristic for more civil wars in the 19th and 20th century, the opponent is seen as a foreigner, or at least as a traitor, or as a bad connational, or as someone who does not deserve to be a member of the national community. And the Spanish case is not an exception. Uh, for m many exiles, many Republican exiles, but also for many representatives of the Francoist narrative until, well, into the 1970s, the Spanish Civil War, uh, the Spanish Civil War, had not been a civil war, but had been a war against an invader, either uh, a fascist invader, or using Moroccan soldiers and Portuguese soldiers and Italian soldiers, or a communist, particularly a Soviet invader. 
and there were many representatives of the generation which experienced the civil war who were convinced of that narrative. And uh, well, in that case, and this refers to your question as well, uh, I think it's not always that easy to differentiate between civil wars and external aggressions because most experiences of occupation in Europe in the 20th century, particularly in, in the, uh, during and in the aftermath of the Second uh, World War, have also been accompanied by phenomena, phenomena like collaboration and civil war. Let's remember, for instance, the Italian case as the fall of Mussolini was followed by a civil war. But Italian public opinion and Italian historiography was reluctant to accept this label. As everything was due to the, to the occupants, everything was blamed, or the Germans were blamed for everything wrong, and no forces exist anymore in Italy after 43. And well, uh, mm, I think this is an academic uh, conference, and usually historians historians rely on mm, scientific approach, some kind of relative scientific approach. And so usually after more than 30 years of researching about the Spanish Civil War and dictatorship, I don't use political, political approaches to history. We differ about how to interpret the past, but I am not using eh, ever, ever political approaches, even though some people, because they have different opinion, eh, think that we are using this kind of political uh, approach. I mean, the, the Spanish history until 1945, if we compare and if we go to what German historians, Italian historians, historians in other different places, until 1945, everything happening in Spain, in Spain from the 30s until 1945, was very similar to this European civil war. The main exceptionalism of the Spain in comparison with Western societies in Europe was everything happening from 1945 to 1975. And this is also the Portuguese exceptionalism, where the only dictators ultra-rightist, fascist dictators coming before the Second World War and lasting for more than 30 years after the Second World War. Comparison is the key to understand many things in history, not political opinion, journalism, or ideological opinions. Dear colleagues, uh, at the start I promised you that this session will be very interesting. It's proved to be the case. Tomasz Stryk, Szesze Szesze, Julian Kazanova, we're with you today. Let's applaud them.